Welcome to the 10th hearing of the Public Accountability Committee's inquiry into the appointment of Mr John Barillaro as Senior Trade and Investment Commissioner to the Americas. The inquiry is examining the circumstances leading up to the appointment of the various commissioners, including the processes, probity and integrity measures undertaken. I acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians on the lands on which we are meeting today. <coughs> I pay my respects to Elders past and present and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of New South Wales. I also acknowledge and pay my respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. Today we'll be hearing from one witness, Mr Michael Pratt, former Secretary, New South Wales Treasury. I thank Mr Pratt for making the time to give evidence to this important inquiry. Before we commence, I'd like to make some brief comments about the procedures for today's hearing. Today's hearing is being broadcast live via the Parliament's website. A transcript of today's hearing will be placed on the committee's website when it becomes available. In accordance with the broadcasting guidelines, the House has authorised the filming, broadcasting and photography of committee proceedings by representatives of media organisations from any position in the room and by any member of the public from any position in the audience. Any person filming or photographing proceedings must take responsibility for the proper use of that material. This is detailed in the broadcasting resolution a copy of which is available from the Secretariat. While parliamentary privilege applies to witnesses giving evidence today, it does not apply to what witnesses say outside of their evidence at the hearing. I therefore urge witnesses to be careful about comments you may make to the media or to others after you complete your evidence. All witnesses have a right to procedural fairness according to the procedural fairness resolution adopted by the House in 2018. If witnesses are unable to answer a question today and want more time to respond, they can take a question on notice. Written answers to questions taken on notice are to be provided within 21 days. If witnesses wish to hand up documents, they should do so through the committee staff. Finally, could everyone please turn their mobile phones to silent for the duration of the hearing. I now welcome our first witness, Mr Pratt. Could you please state your name, the capacity in which you are appearing today and swear either an oath or an affirmation? Michael Thomas Pratt, private citizen. <coughs> I'll swear an oath. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you, Mr Pratt. Now, would you like to start by making a short opening statement? No, I have no opening okay, statement. Okay, that's fine. Thank you very much. We'll proceed uh, straight with questions from the opposition, Mr Mulkey. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Mr Pratt, for taking the time to join with us this morning. It's appreciated very much. Um, Mr Pratt, just at first instance, I should just formally table the, the tender bundle that I think a copy has been made available to you or should be... Available to yes. you? Great. Um, Mr Pratt, you can see that in the first few pages of that are the answers, <coughs> that, uh, the written answers that you provided to this committee at, uh, after our request. And I just want to firstly say thank you for pro providing that with those answers. Is there any further information or that you'd like to provide about those matters in addition to what you did on the 9th of September 2022? Um, <coughs> well, perhaps, Mr Mookie, I could clarify my responses if that would help the committee? It would. Um, I mean, I must say from the outset, I was extremely disappointed and annoyed to get your letter, Chair. To get? To get your letter, your recent letter to me, which I thought was inflammatory. Um, I wasn't asked to qualify my responses, which Mr Mookie is now doing. Um, I've had a long career, both in the private and the public sector, where no one has ever questioned my integrity or doing the right thing. And to get that letter as a private citizen from this committee is completely unacceptable. Thank you, Mr Barrett. I think you'll also find that we were trying to uh, uh, request that you appear before the committee. So I think this was about the third correspondence that we had with you were, in fact, your, your lawyer. Uh, so that was why we outlaid, outlaid basically the reason why we wanted you to appear before this committee. So I think it was it was appropriate for us to do that. So if we could just continue with the Chair, questions I was being rather than question I was the being conduct of this committee is overseas. probably not the best way to start. I advised you that my mother was seriously ill and passing away, which she has since done. I mean, I just found that behaviour incredible. Mr. So Pratt. I want that on hand side because it is completely unacceptable. Okay, you are here now before this committee, so shall we conduct the questions as opposed to you commencing with, with questioning the entire uh, proceedings today and whether we should have invited you in the first place? I find that extraordinary. So shall, I so wasn't we, we'll questioning go straight that. To questions. I was questioning your letter, Chair. Chair, I'm just going to raise a point of order. Um, you know, Mr Pratt has come here of his own volition. I believe he's uh, entitled to um, make an opening statement and, um, he just declined to do. I know, but he's now seeking to put something from... Could have done this at the beginning. 
I decline to do because I'm now responding to Mr Mookie's question, can, can I just, okay, which order, I have every order, right order. to Let's, do. I, I have asked Mr Pratt, and to be fair to Mr Pratt, <coughs> he's responding. Um, I appreciate the fact, but perhaps, Chair, can I just encourage Mr Pratt to be given the opportunity to clarify his written answers as I think he wishes yes, to Yes, if we could get back on track, Mr Pratt. Thank you. So, Mr Mookie, you and I have worked in different modes for quite a long time and you're well aware that I take my responsibility seriously. I always have. I've always responded to committees as I, best I can to give committees information they need. So I, I preface my comments with those remarks. Mr Pratt, I should just say that in the years of interaction you and I have had, I've always understood um, that you have taken your responsibilities to parliamentary committees seriously. Thank you. So in that context, my responses to the committee, and particularly questions one and two, uh, was not meant in any way to mislead the committee, but rather to clarify for the committee what I thought was some uncertain <coughs> statements in, in that, uh, particularly the first one, uh, which I read more as a statement, not as a question. So the selection process, which led to the selection of Mr Paul Webster as the preferred candidate for the role of the New South Wales Agent General to the UK. Now, the statement refers to both the selection of Mr Webster and his so-called status as preferred. Now, both imply a choice being made to appoint Mr Webster to the role. In fact, one of the meanings of the word prefer or preferred is to choose or to make a choice, a decision being made. Even more so, Oxford goes on to say, appoint a person to a prestigious position. So it is in that context, when I looked at the meaning of that word, that I responded accordingly, because I have no recollection of any final choice being made or approval given for Mr Webster in the role. The process that you read about in the papers that I was sent, uh, thank you, by Jenny West, is laying out a process of approval, not final approval. Now, Mr Webster, to the best of my recollection, was never a final choice was never the preferred candidate by definition. He was never given a letter of offer, etc. Now, if you had asked me if he was the leading candidate or a lead candidate at the time, at that point in time, then clearly I would have said yes. But let me remind you of my response in my written evidence about Mr Webster, and I tried to, Mr Mulkey, give you as much information as I could at the time. And I said Mr Webster was a strong candidate with deep experience in transactional trade and administration. However, the selection panel questioned whether Mr Webster was ready to step up to the agent general role. And the selection panel felt that there were gaps around the significant experience required for executive representation, influencing and stakeholder management. The panel was progressing to test his suitability further with Premier, Deputy Premier, Treasurer, at that point, also, a new candidate was introduced by the Deputy Premier, Minister for Trade at the time, and he was ultimately successful, that is, Mr Cartwright, given a better fit for the role. On question two, that becomes self-evident, given the response on question one. So, Mr Mookie, that's my clarification of why I answered in that way. Thank you, Mr Pratt. That's appreciated. Um, can I just start to um, work through some of the issues that the committee has heard as well. And again, just repeat, uh, certainly my appreciation for your giving of evidence on these matters, given some of the other people are not yet available to, to shed light on these events. But you say that Mr Cartwright became the preferred candidate of the, or became recommended into the process by the Deputy Premier. I heard that correct? That's correct. Do you recall when that happened? Mr Mulkey, my challenge is dates, of course, because I have no documentation, uh, et cetera, but um, I, I could say directionally that would have been around February, March. OK. Can, um, just some preliminary, I guess we probably should clear up. Um, you were the Secretary of the Treasury from when exactly to...? Uh, I think July of 2017. To earlier to this year. To February this year. Yeah. Great, thank you. And in the period from 2019... To 2021, actually 20, yeah, 2021, uh, the Treasurer was Dominic Perrette and the Minister for Trade was John Barillaro, both of whom were supported by the Treasury cluster. 
Uh, yes, that's correct. And uh, Miss Jenny West was the DEPSEC supporting the Deputy Premier in trade. Yes. So to the extent to which you are having conversations with John Barillaro about these matters, it's because you are his secretary who supports him in the discharge of his responsibilities as Minister for Trade? Um, technically, that's right. But in practice, what happened was, because I had the broader responsibilities of the portfolio, uh, Miss West was his direct point of contact on okay. trade. Yes. Yes. Okay. And that arrangement lasted till approximately March 2021, correct? Yes, um, that's correct. And then the functions were moved to DPC. And you make reference to this in your written answers, um, which you'll see on page two of the tender bundle, when you say that <coughs> the processes that led to the creation of investment in New South Wales took place circa 8 March 2021. You make the point that uh, you, were, you were attending budget estimates with Treasurer Perrottet Think, to be fair, me, um, <laughs> as well, uh, when you received an email from Miss Brown, including a brief from Miss Brown to Premier Berejiklian, and the brief requested the transfer of all global New South Wales responsibility to investment in New South Wales. This included all components of the strategy people on budget. The brief had been approved by the Premier, and you say that whilst I thought the means of communicating the transfer was somewhat unusual, i.e. no prior discussion, no meetings, no phone conversations, you respect the right of the Premier to decide who's the leader of trade. So I inferred from that that until you got that brief while you were probably sitting in this room, you didn't know that such a transfer was imminent? Absolutely no idea, Mr Mookie. Right. And um, look, I, I, this had a huge amount of interest at senior levels in government, as I think you're probably well aware. Um, do you mind moving the microphone forward, Mr Pratt? I'm sorry. I, I picked up a bug on the plane coming back. I'm, oh, I do apologise. Is that better? It is. Mm. Okay. That's good. Um, the actual global New South Wales strategy was designed and developed in Treasury. And that work commenced in 2019, didn't it? That's correct. Because you and I were discussing this in earlier your estimates hearings in 2019. Yes. Yes. But a lot of it was on hold through COVID. You know, yep. we, we really had obviously other priorities. Um, but the launch of that then, when it was completed, was done by the Premier, Deputy Premier and Treasurer. So they all had a serious interest in this particular strategy. Um, and then the... Um, the Deputy Premier was also then appointed the Minister for Trade at a point in time uh, through that, that period. Um, what I was really surprised about is that things were progressing well on track. Um, and normally if you make an organisational change of that seriousness, first thing I do is ring you up, Mr Mookie, and say, can we have a conversation um, and let's talk about it. And it's not a question whether you do it or not, but it's how you do it in the right way. Um, so I was sitting in estimates, and that's why I remember the date, because it was the 8th of March. Mm. Uh, and I received an email uh, while I was there from Miss Brown with a brief enclosed, signed by the Premier, moving it to DPC. Um, so that did surprise me. Uh, but as I said in my written evidence, I mean, clearly that's the Premier's prerogative. And I, I understand as the head of state, she wanted to be the head of investment and trade. But the process to get to that point... Um, wasn't what I would have done. So was it, just to be clear here, this involved a transfer of quite a serious amount of Treasury function, didn't it? It did. A significant number of people. Over um, 100, was it? It was over 100. It was the biggest unit in Treasury. And it was taken off you, or which is the prerogative of the Premier, without necessarily having conversations with you. Now, look, I'm not, I've never been concerned about headcount in my career, Mr Mookie, I think. No, no, that's true. It's, it's the technical challenge of the job that interests me, not mm. the headcount. Um, but yes, it was it was a big slice of budget and a big slice of people coming out of Treasury. And is it the case that uh, that you had obviously no opportunity to input in prior to the decision being made, let alone about the process by which it would be affected? I had no I had no involvement before that email. No no message. No. Did no. you even know that investment in New South Wales was being formed? My, look, I, I'm hesitant to say yes or no on that because I really can't recall. But um, it's certainly around that time, I, I think there was there were stories around about Investment New South Wales doing some work or being being brought together. There was nothing around though about moving Global New South Wales into that structure. Did you consider this a vote of no confidence in the way in which Treasury was developing the Global New South Wales strategy? Some of my team did, Mr. Mookie. I didn't because I've been around government long enough to appreciate these things occur. <laughs> Um, but um, some of my teams certainly were affronted by it, yes. 
did the Treasurer know this was happening? Not to my knowledge. I mean, did that would need to be a question for him, but I don't think he was aware, no. Presumably you raised it with him, though. Absolutely, point, straight yeah. after estimates. And when you raised it, did you form the view that he had known about this previously? No, I didn't, no. Did he give you any, share any insight about any conversations he may have had with the Premier before he lost a significant part of his of the responsibilities of the Treasury? No, he did not, no. Okay. So he was, the first time he learnt about it was when you told him? Well, I, I have to say I suspect it was, but I'm not sure, I'm not definite on that, but I suspect it was, yes. And equally... Uh, did the Minister for Trade know? I don't know. Okay. Did you have any conversations with Mr Barillaro about this matter? No, I did not. Okay. No. And did that result in the Minister for Barillaro being transferred to the DPC as well as in terms yes, of... It did. Support? Yes, it So at that point, Mr Barillaro ceases to be a, min a Treasury Cluster Minister, correct? That's correct. Okay. So, look, Mr Pratt, oh, that's very helpful because we are... There's a lot of movements around the administrative mm. arrangements around this period of time, which is important to understand some of the events which take place in February of that year. But... Let's just return to the question around when Mr Barillaro recommend... Well, did Mr Barillaro recommend to you that Mr Cartwright be a candidate who was considered for the role? Yes, he did. How did he do that? Look, I don't recall how. It may have been a conversation in the corridor or a phone call. Um, it was probably more so through Miss West because that was his direct contact. But the referral for Mr Cartwright um, definitely came through the Deputy Premier. Directly through staff or you have no recollection? No, I'm sorry, Mr Mulgee, I can't recall how, but that I, I can assure you that's exactly how it came through and I did check that with my fellow colleague, uh, Mr Reardon, as well. Um, so that, that was the case, yes. And when, when you say you checked with Mr Reardon, do you mean at the time or do you mean subsequently? No, I mean subsequently, Mr Graham. I wanted to make sure that we were yep. both uh, recalling the same events, yep. if you like, and, and that Thank was you. his understanding too. Uh, Okay, let me just ask, did you have, ever have a direct conversation with Mr Barillaro about Mr Cartwright's potential candidacy? Uh, not that I can recall, no. Okay, so there's a bit of confusion here around all this um, and quite a lot turns on it because it, a lot of Mr Cartwright's sort of expectations are set <laughs> through these very preliminary conversations that I had. But Miss West, in her written answers to us, says uh, that she believes that Either you, Mr Warwick Smith, approached Mr Cartwright directly to uh, consider a candidacy. I'll, I'll just read to you. Um, I apologise for not providing you the actual thing, but I can provide it after I read it to you. Uh, but she goes, in response to the same question that we asked you, which was the selection process which led to the replacement of Paul Webster as a preferred candidate for the role of Agent General with Mr Stephen Cartwright, uh, she goes, I'm aware that Stephen Cartwright had recently resigned from his role at Business New South Wales and approached one of the members of the recruitment panel directly. Sorry, that's a difference. Um, I believe this was either Mr Secretary Pratt or Mr Smith. So just to be clear here, uh, Mr Barillaro was the person who raised it with you, not the other way around. No, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And when Mr Barillaro raised it with you, do you recall where... Uh, did he allude to in what context he came to understand Mr Cartwright was interested or could have been interested? I think he may have mentioned that he'd caught up with Mr Cartwright at some stage um, and that uh, he thinks Mr Cartwright would have been a very good candidate for the role. Um, I should also say, Mr Mookie, that I had a coffee with Mr Cartwright at one stage. I can't remember the exact date of that. But he raised it with me himself. He asked me about the global New South Wales strategy and what we were doing in trade, and he had some interest in it. Um, and so, you know, he raised that with me. I didn't raise it with him, but he, he, I remember that because he was actually asking me for some career advice because he'd actually finished up in his role as Business New South Wales. Yeah, we'll tease out some of those events, but my colleague might have a question. No, it was well, just to support it. So his interest in it was just not just... It was really about whether there were, could be a place for him within that strategy. Is that the way... Yes, I think he was well aware that we were recruiting for the Trade Commissioner jobs. Right, OK. Um, and saw something like that for him. Mm. So when Mr Barillaro mentioned it to you, uh, did you tell him that, I think the word you used, that there was a leading candidate who'd already been settled upon? Look, I can't recall, but uh, I'm sure I would have discussed that at the time. 
um, because we would have progressed the uh, detail of those, you know, the files, etc., forward for interviews. So I'm assuming Mr. Barilaro would have had that documentation. And did you uh, at all uh, say to Mr. Barilaro that applications had closed and they'd been closed for a long time for this type of role? No. And did you tell him that the selection panel that had decided upon, I think, the way, again, the, the term you used, the leading candidate, had already met, uh, that there was a draft selection report in place that recommended him that you had already authorised the commencement of salary negotiations? Uh, well, I, I, the latter part of that statement, Mr Mookie, I, I would say certainly my own involvement, definitely not. I mean, I don't think we got anywhere near remuneration negotiation. Um, there was still a process to go through as per the documentation re-interviews. Um, so... You know, the, the situation with Mr Webster, he was by, by no means confirmed, as I've indicated earlier. Um, and the gaps the committee had with Mr Webster were still evident. So we had not resolved that executive representation, stakeholder management, you know, those issues that I raised earlier were still in place and still concerns. But uh, we will explore the extent to which Mr Webster was or wasn't a preferred candidate shortly. But I guess my point is, did you bring to the attention of Mr Barilaro the fact that at least we can agree that the process with Mr Webster was advanced? Look, I can't recall specifically that I said that, no. OK. Um, again, do you, I, I do invite you, Mr Pratt, to search um, to see if there's any better recall around the timing or was it a, or of the conversation with Mr Barilaro. Um, no further recollection that you have other than somewhere February or March? It would have been it would have been somewhere mid late February early March. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Mookie, without reference to diaries and things, I don't know. But that that would have been the period. And do you recall whether or not it was in meeting on the phone, email? How is this conversation taking place? No, I don't. Okay, because there's quite a bit of discrepancy now around some of the evidence that we've heard. Um, so I think we'll have to unpack it a bit. Uh, if we, in respect to when this conversation takes place, Miss Dr. Broadbent. Well, actually, before we get to that, did you tell Dr Broadbent to put uh, Mr Barilaro into the... to consider Mr Barilaro? For you? Sorry, to Mr Cartwright for the position to the Asian General? It's possible I did once we'd admitted him into the process. That, that would have... I mean, we would have gone back through the panel to make sure the panel was comfortable with his entry and then one of us, although more likely Miss West, because she was the secretariat into the recruiter, it was more likely Miss West that would have done that. Do you recall telling Dr Broadbent um, at the meeting of the selection panel for the Japan position <clears throat> that Mr Cartwright was to be considered as a candidate? I don't recall, no. Okay. Is it possible that you did? It's possible that I did. Um, that would have been after he'd already been admitted by the panel, not before. If, okay. if, in fact, I did do that, but I, I don't recall. Okay. Can you turn... We'll just have to unpack this in a bit of sequence here. Do you mind turning to page 53 of the tender bundle? Just Do you want to read the highlighted sections? Okay, yes. So just working through, this is the evidence that Dr Broadbent gave us. Um, you can see that I ask her effectively how Mr Cartwright entered it. And she says at the start of the highlighted section, my understanding is that I received advice that there was to be another candidate considered. I received that advice from the Secretary of New South Wales Treasury at the time, and that candidate was Mr Stephen Cartwright. And we were asked to keep things open so that Mr Cartwright could be considered. Um, just do you, do you recall giving Ms Dr Broadbent that advice? I don't recall this, but, I mean, that's quite possible. This would have been post the uh, introduction of the Deputy Premier of this candidate into the process. 
Yeah. Um, and it would have gone to the panel and then as a, as a result of that, it's possible then I instructed Miss um, Broadbent accordingly, yes. To, so you do kind of think that it's possible that you instructed Miss Broadbent, to, Dr Broadbent, to keep the process open so Mr Cartwright could be considered? It's possible, yes. Okay. And uh, you can see just going down, you can see that I pushed Dr Broadbent for some better recollection and she goes, it was actually at a meeting that we had, I think we were at the other panel meetings. And then you can see later on, she meant, I asked whether or not it was the Japan panel and she says, I expect it was at the time. And you can see that I also established that you were a member of that panel as well. Um, you see that bit there? This is down the bottom? Just in the middle of the highlighted section. Yes. Okay. So uh, Dr. Broadbent said it was at the Japan panel, which was the only time that she was really interacting with you face to face at the time. Does that accord with your recollection or give you any better insight? No, look, I'm sorry, Mr. Moogie. I really don't recall any of this detail. Okay. Do you mind just turning to page 59 of the Tender Bundle? So, again, Mr. Uh, Mr. Pratt, you, know, you wouldn't have seen this email at all um, whatsoever. But what you can see is, is that... Uh, it does actually give us the date of the Japan panel meeting. And you can see here that the Japan panel meeting is confirmed to have taken place on the 2nd of February 2021 and that you were at that meeting uh, with Mr. Reed and Ms. Smith, Ms. West as well. And so in terms of establishing when this conversation may have happened with Mr. Barrel Aro, um, there's a strong suggestion here that's happening around the 2nd of February or at least it's happened before the 2nd of February, 2021. Uh, because according to Dr. Broadbent, she hears from you that Mr. Cartwright should be considered at the Japan panel meeting, which we now establish takes place on 2nd February, 2021. Is it possible that actually the conversations that you were having with Mr. Barilaro was taking place from late January to February, as opposed to February to March? Look, I don't know. I can't <coughs> recall, but I... You know, I don't remember a specific conversation with Mr Barilaro, but it wouldn't have been more than one conversation in any case uh, if that did occur. Okay. Um. Ms. Broad Dr Broadbent does recall, though, that um, this came about as a as the result of a discussion with the then Deputy Premier. If you turn over that page, page. Um, you'll see that she agrees with your... Observation then, when asked by Mr Mookie, how did this happen? How was Stephen Cartwright identified by Mike Pratt? Dr Broadbent says, I understand that Stephen Cartwright, as has now been released, had a discussion with the then Deputy Premier. Right, I wasn't a party to that discussion, Mr Graham. I really don't know about it. OK. Um, so... I mean, to be frank, we, we do need to hear from Mr Barilaro about this, which about his version of events as well uh, in this respect. Um, but as a counterparty to that conversation and in his absence, that we do appreciate you being here to help clarify some of these issues here. But this then raises the question then about effectively the, the effect of Mr Barilaro's intervention on a process that was already underway. Um, can you just... Give me, uh, if it's possible, Mr Pratt, an explanation as to the process that you understood Treasury was following to, to identify a UK agent general. Um, it was a, I guess what I'd call a pretty standard recruitment process for a recruiter. Um, mm. So, you know, you, you get the position description well defined, what the requirements are, the capabilities, uh, what the outcomes are you're looking for for the role and do get that well documented. Um, you then get the recruiter to start scanning the market and you go from long list to short list. That's, you know, a practice that you'd be well familiar with and that was the practice undertaken. What was a little unusual about this search was COVID. It started but then it stopped um, due to COVID for a significant period of time. Um, and then it restarted and, in fact, I think you're probably aware that Mr Webster was identified in the first process uh, but put on hold um, for the COVID period. Um, the candidates then went through the interview process, the shortlisted. Um, 
I think from memory in most cases that was two interviews. Um, and then the headhunter, the recruiter would provide input um, and then the panel would come to a decision, uh, you then go to reference checking, et cetera. So that was the pretty standard process, Mr Mookie, that we undertook. And I presume that you as Secretary of the Treasury, who was responsible for re-establishing this position after three decades after it was abolished in some controversial circumstances, was mindful of the fact that it needed to be conducted, the recruitment process needed to be conducted fairly? Um, fairly, and may I say absolutely free of politics. And you took that and, and you ensured that the people who you were asking to lead this for you, you were aware of that? And Absolutely were, aware of it. <laughs> and you, you understood that, of course, that the legitimacy of this position would actually turn on whether or not the person who was chosen was seen to be uh, independent politically and, not fav and capable of doing the job? And I can't tell you how strong I was on that point and hence why you had the two most senior people in the public sector on the panel, in Mr Reardon and myself. And that was designed to send a signal about how crucial it was to get this right? Correct. And presumably that's why you kept yourself engaged in the selection of the New York position at various points in time, the UK position and the Japanese position? Yes. Well, really, I didn't have anything to do much with New York. Uh, that was after it moved, really, to DPC. But um, I was certainly engaged in both Japan and the Agent General in the UK, yes. And that's part of the reasons why you went to an external recruiter, to run the process that's to create correct. some distance and you went to a highly reputable one as well? Yes, that's correct, who's done a lot of work for both state and federal government. Yes. So they had done, uh, I might just add, one of the reasons why they were appealing is they've done a lot of work for Austrade um, as well. So, And you made the point that there was, regardless of the fact that the process to choose the job had to be run by the, you know, ideally by the public service in a political manner, but there was huge interest in the rollout of the global New South Wales strategy by the senior members of the government. Is that right? Yes. Look, the the role, as you're probably aware, but had some unique um, characteristics to it. So the role itself had to be reapproved through uh, the High Commissioner in the UK, George Brandis, at the time, and I think he had to go to the Queen actually to get that approved. And then on the approval side of the individual, that had to go through Cabinet. So it was a unique role in many ways, given history. And uh, But there was huge interest in the leadership of the government, who, to be fair to them, had taken some risk to pursue this strategy politically uh, by the Premier, the Deputy Premier and the Treasurer. Um, Mr Mookie, I, I, would, I, I guess I'd make the observation that when I first got engaged in looking at this... Um, we had one person in the UK representing New South Wales. Sure. I mean, it was embarrassing. South Australia, Queensland, Victoria had a floor each in the Australia House. Um, so it was pretty obvious that something needed to be done. And in my, you know, I used to say that South Australia did better in London than they did in Adelaide um, because we weren't represented and we were leveraged off the Opera House and... Uh, the bridge for far too long. So there was no question this was necessary and there was risk in it, but it was an important thing to do for the state. And presumably, therefore, the Treasurer, the Deputy Premier and the Premier had some interest in this. Definitely, yes. And so given, as you just said, how important it was effectively to make sure that this, scene was, this was both above politics and I believe seen to be above politics, when the Deputy Premier told you that I, Stephen Cartwright's a great guy and maybe he should be considered for the role, um, did you not sort of go... That's a pretty naked form of political intervention that totally undermined the work that you were doing as Treasury? Um, look, if he'd intervened after that, the answer would absolutely be yes. But um, if it was me or Jenny West, and I, I, as I said, I, I'm not able to recall exactly who, but Mr Barilara would have been told not to interfere. Once the referral was made, it's up to the panel and we're prepared to put him through a process but for Mr Barilaro's recommendation, he never would have been anywhere near the panel. Well, not unless he came to me um, separately and asked to be included. He may well have, you know, done that had he not got Mr Barilaro's. But had any other candidate approached you directly and asked to enter the race? A couple had, and they didn't. They didn't go through with it. Yes. What, what, what separate from the independent senior process? business people? Not not at that time, Mr. Mookie. I'm going back over the period. Yeah, sure. But oh, other yeah. people, and you rejected them. I, well, I didn't reject them. I said to them, this is the role, go away and think about it, and I never heard back from them. So... I mean, this was a very... This is a huge role that created a lot of interest. But, but, but again, but for the fact that Mr Barilaro and Mr Cartwright had a conversation, he never would have been considered for the job, correct? 
Well, if he'd approached me directly, I would have thought about putting him in the panel. But that's not the question I'm asking you, Mr Pratt. Well, in this, what actually occurred, the, the answer to your question is yes, you're correct. Because the reason is, is that at this point, applications had well and truly closed some five months before, correct? Well, the process hadn't closed. We hadn't had further applications, but the process, I mean, in these well, big in jobs... in February, was anyone else given the opportunity to put their hand in, up for the job? Well, the process was still open as far as I was concerned, so the headhunter was managing that. Um, <coughs> so I, how I mean, would it, someone else be able to get themselves into the process? Well, I mean, that was for the headhunter to, to actually follow up accordingly. I mean, that's why we paid but, that person. But Mr Cartwright never went to the headhunter. He went to the Deputy Premier. Like, uh, he, if, you, if, your pro, if your point is, is that the process was open and people could still go to the headhunter, that, that's a fair point, but that's not what Mr Cartwright did. Mr Cartwright went to the Deputy Premier. But was it not the Deputy Premier that raised it with Mr Cartwright? I don't think Mr Cartwright raised it with him, did well, he? Well, the evidence from Mr Cartwright is that's correct. Which kind of raises my point, right? Like, which we've got effectively the Deputy Premier headhunting his own candidates despite you running or trying to run a very independent process. No, I understand where you're coming from, but my point is that um, he had a right as the Trade Minister to rep recommend someone into the process. Why did he say that? Because the process wasn't closed. But, 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 I mean, look, there's been a lot of ambiguity about what role ministers have or did not have in this process at what points in time, to be frank. Um... Uh, but to be fair, uh, elsewhere in respect to the other positions, it's never really been an accepted proposition that ministers could involve themselves. In fact, when it comes to the America's position, one minister got themselves into a lot of trouble after they did. Mm. So when you say that he had a right, to what gave him that right? Because this was meant to be a process a independent of... of Sorry, let me ask you a question before we get the point of order. No, no, no. no. The, the, question, the well, point of order is about the question. Well, can okay. I can finish the question and then you can take well, the no, point? No, no. Well, I think before... I'm going to take the point of order if that's okay. The way you phrased that question about um, a minister got himself in quite a bit of trouble, um, I'll just make the point that um, there's been reviews obviously done on that and there's been... Uh, uh, people have been cleared. So I think that perhaps the way you phrased the question is somewhat uh, subjective and I'd ask that you be cognisant of that when you're putting the question. Where's through me, please, but that, that isn't a, a point of order if uh, the member can, can continue his questioning. Thank you. Mr Pratt, I mean, it, was there a legal basis for the Minister for Trade to be able to submit a candidate that you were aware of? Well, the process was still open. I mean, um, there was no issue about entering someone else into the process. Um, where I would have had an issue is if Mr Barrow then interfered in the assessment process in the panel, I would not have stood for that, clearly. But, but he did not. But you, I guess the difference of, that we, you and I might have on this is that you don't see the fact that Mr Barrow, of his own volition, uh, approached a candidate, asked them to apply, was actually interference. No, I don't. Okay. No, interference, once he was in the process... I would not have stood for Mr Mookie, yes. Okay. Uh, well, then that sort of... I want to ask my colleague a question. Can I just turn back to that entry point into the process and the answer you gave earlier on that? Because looking at Dr Broadbent's evidence, the entry to the process looks like this 2nd of February meeting discussing the Tokyo stick roll. Mm -hmm. And her recollection is you facilitate the entry to the process. You've said you believe that's not the case, that, in fact the Deputy Premier had earlier facilitated Stephen Cartwright's entry into the process. What is the basis of your belief? Because I didn't do it unless it was put to me. Um, mm. I mean, I didn't approach Mr Cartwright, Mr Graham. Mm. Um, yeah. So um, it was put to me, you know, either through a discussion or through my Deputy Secretary, Miss West, that Mr yep. Barrolaro asked for Mr Cartwright mm. to be entered into mm. the process. Mm. But is, do you agree on the 2nd of February, this is when he enters the process, when you then raise it with Dr Broadbent? Look, I, I, don't, I don't agree because I, I, I just can't confirm that date, I'm sorry. Yep. But what I am clear of, it was the Deputy Premier that asked yes. for him to Who go into the process. who initiated that, understood. Um, and, once in the pro and that was then referred to the panel to make sure that my colleagues were comfortable with that and, and they wh were. Who referred it to the panel? Me. 
in, you, as the chair in, in this meeting or previously? I, look, I, I don't know what date that meeting was, but it was post Mr. Barillaro asking for Mr. Yep. Cartwright to be entered. Um, it was so did you do that by, by letter or by? It would have been in a or... panel meeting. It would have been in a discussion. So this could have been that referral. It could have been. Yeah. Um, but look, as I said, I, I don't recall the date. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, the panel would have confirmed that, and then he entered the process. Uh, well, just on that, Mr. Pratt, there's no documentation of the panel being given any written notification of a new candidate, and there's no evidence of a meeting of the panel for the UK position until the 30th of March, which they then only interview Mr Cartwright. So is it possible that it was a Japan position or...? Look, I, I, look I'm trying to help you, Mr Mookie, but I, I'm not going to commit to timing when I don't know. OK, I don't fair enough. Cool. I presume there's no point in you taking that on notice. <laughs> no. <you> <laughs> OK, fair enough. Um, uh, let's, returning, I guess, to the point about Mr Barilaro's intervention, I accept the fact that you and I disagree about whether that's intervention. Did you raise it with the Treasurer? Did you talk to the Treasurer about the fact that Mr Barilaro had now found Mr Cartwright, given Mr Cartwright was a well-known business figure in New South Wales? Look, again, I don't recall, but it's possible I would have because I, I, as I would, as the Secretary, keep the Treasurer abreast of what was going on in different things. Yeah. This was obviously an important matter. Um, I don't specifically recall a conversation, Mr Moogie, but it's possible that I did, yes. Okay, so... Uh, just in respect to that, uh, the Treasurer was interested, was he not, in the actual selection of the role? Definitely, yes. And in January of that year, he was taking a direct interest in the role, correct? I think he would have been interested throughout this whole period, really. Can uh, you turn to page 24 of the tender bundle? Okay, thank you. So this is, and we'll unpack how this all came about, um, but to jump to this part of the story, you can see that following, which will show you your endorsement for Mr Webster to progress and be interviewed by the Treasurer, or at least meet with the Treasurer, the Deputy Premier and the Premier, you can see that officials in your department commence work to arrange that meeting. And you can see at the bottom of the page that uh, uh, you can see a correspondence from a person in Treasury, in fact, may have been your executive assistant, correct? That's correct, yes. You can see your executive assistant on the 12th of January is telling the Treasurer's, I believe, his executive assistant that Treasury engaged NGS Global to conduct executive search for the Agent General and the panel has now concluded the interview process and are recommending Mr Paul Webster for review and endorsement by the Treasurer. You see that they send the, the, the resume, the job description, interview notes and they can ask if the Treasurer is available to meet with Mr Webster. You see that? I do, yes. I can only presume that you did actually cause your EA to make this request? I would assume so, yes. Yeah. And then we'll get to that and we'll get to the fact that it says that the panel had concluded its process and are recommending Mr Webster for the job compared to what you told us earlier. But you can see above, you can see that the Treasurer's EA responds by going, uh, before proceeding to scheduling an meeting between the Treasurer and Mr Paul Webster, the Treasurer has requested a short list of the other candidates that were interviewed together with a copy of their resume. When the info is available, can you please send to me and I'll forward to the Treasurer for his attention. And you can see also that they CC the then Treasurer's chief of staff uh, as well. Did you see that? I do, yes. As well. And then if you just turn to page 23... You can see that your EA actually quite promptly, by government standards certainly, uh, returns the shortlist to the Treasurer's office. Right. And uh, gets it, effectively meets the Treasurer's request. And this is all taking place between the 25th of January and the 27th of January, which is, turns out to be a few days before the Japan panel meeting as well. So in that period of time, did you and the Treasurer have conversations about who was to be the UK Agent General? 
Not that I can recall, no. Did the Treasurer express to you any opposition to the candidacy of Mr Webster? No, not that I can recall. Given that Mr Web Cartwright isn't selected by the panel to the 31st of March, do you have any explanation as to why the Treasurer never met with Mr Webster? No, not that I can recall. And do you recall talking to the Treasurer's Chief of Staff about not proceeding with this meeting? No, I don't. If you just go up to page 23, you can see that, uh, again, your EA is chasing this meeting as well. Actually, to be fair, that might be for the Japan position uh, as well. Do you know whether the Treasurer met with the Japan candidate in around this period of time? I don't know, Mr Mookie, no. Okay. Um, but you don't... But we can establish that the Treasurer asked for a short list, was given a short list. This was affected through your office but you don't have any recall other than that? No, no, clearly that was sent to the Treasurer's office. Uh, but <coughs> I don't recall any discussion post that, no. But you do recall that it's possible that you did disclose to the Treasurer that Mr Barillaro had found Mr Cartwright, uh, or at least the potential for Mr Cartwright to, f to fill the job? Um, it's possible, yes. Do you recall whether the Treasurer said to you anything like, that's a good idea, that's a bad idea? No, I'm sorry, I don't recall. Did you use that as an opportunity to brief the Treasurer on where the process was up to? I may have done, yes. Um, but again, I don't recall. Did the Treasurer make any reference to any conversations he was having with Mr Cartwright at the time? I don't recall, no. Did he suggest to you that he had already spoken to the Deputy Premier and the Deputy Premier and him had already had this discussion? Well, I don't recall those conversations, no. Do you remember what was for morning tea? Do you remember your coffee order? Do you remember... Order. Did you have a question, Wes? Oh, no. Um, Do you have any questions? I'm trying to help you, Mr. Morgan, you are, Mr. Pratt. You are I, actually I really helping. don't recall a lot of those points. This is a key government appointment, though, Mr. Pratt. You're sure you don't recollect any? You're the key official briefing, one of the most senior ministers in the state. Do you have any recollection of whether this was discussed after you sent a shortlist to the no, Treasurer's I, office? No, what, what I recollect happening, Mr Graham, was the material being sent to the Premier, the Treasurer and the Deputy yep. Premier. Um, yep. I don't recall any feedback. I don't know if they met those... If, if the three of them met Mr Webster or what that feedback might have been. Um, hmm. I don't recall any of that. Hmm. The, uh, the, the Treasurer and now the Premier has been very clear that he was quite interested in this whole uh, process, including these appointments... Yes, he, he was definitely interested, yes. But you... This just falls into a black hole after this request, to your recollection. You can't recall another discussion over the months that follow this request for the shortlist, as you sit here today. No, I can't. Um, I mean, look, the role of the panel was to get the best candidate, obviously, mm. and mm. this was a key job. Um, sorry, I'll just give you the context a bit more. Um, the panel, as I indicated earlier, had identified gaps in Mr Webster uh, at the strategic level, not at the operational level. Um, and so that was still in place. Those gaps were still existent. And Mr Cartwright entered the process who met that criteria. So the panel were, frankly, not interested in the politics, as you'd expect we wouldn't be. We were interested in getting the right person for the job. And that's what we focused on. Mm. And, and the question is... At what point was the then Treasurer informed of that process and you have no guidance for no, us No, I'm morning. sorry, I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll unpack some of that as well. But let me just take you to the interactions that you were having with the Deputy Premier at the time, uh, or at least the Treasury was uh, as well, in parallel to the conversations you were having with the uh, Treasurer's office. Do you mind just turning to page 21 of the tender bundle? We're picking up on some correspondence and we'll get to how this contact between Miss West and Mr Braveford takes place shortly. But you can see that effectively in January, Treasury are actioning your instruction to proceed further down the pathway of selecting Mr Webster for the role and that Treasury are contacting uh, various people at this point in time. But we pick up the conversation here when Mr Braveford is going to Miss West uh, following up a whole variety of matters that were seemingly of interest to the Deputy Premier's office, if not the Deputy Premier. Uh, you can see here that 
Mr. Brayford is asking for Miss West for an update on the details for the Asian general appointment. If a candidate has been identified, I would like their details. Do you see that in the second dot point above the highlighted section? Details for the Asian general appointment? Yep. Yep. And you see below that, timelines. The Deputy Premier approved the amended timelines and kept an eye on things. He was disappointed when Treasury brought the initial delay to his attention and I fear slippage and this already delayed timeframes is occurring. Do you see that? I do. Did the Deputy Premier tell you he was disappointed in Treasury? No, and I don't know why he was disappointed, Mr Mookie. <laughs> were, were the Deputy... Did Miss West alert you to the fact that apparently the Deputy Premier's office had an issue with the timelines? Look, I, I'm aware that there was stress between Miss West and the Deputy Premier's office a number of times. Um, yes. But I don't think Treasury had dragged their heels on this. I think, you know, it was on track. So I'm a bit surprised at that comment, frankly. Yep. Okay, but he never, the Deputy Premier never expressed to you concern with the process you were running? No. He never no. suggested to you that you've come up with a bad candidate or, in addition to that, your candidate that you've come up with is late? No. And Okay, let's just go forward to page 20. Backwards to 20? Yeah, backwards to page 20. Is, you're correct. You can see down the bottom there, Miss West follows up. Mr. Brayford sends this email to Miss West complaining on a, at 3.25 p.m. on a Friday. Miss West is responding on the Monday. You can see that she forwards to your EA and CCs Mr. Brayford a request to schedule a time for the Deputy Premier and Mr. Brayford to meet with the proposed candidate for the UK Agent General. And then she also alerts Mr. Brayford to the fact that he'd be meeting with the Treasurer and George Brandis. Uh, you see that? Yes, I do. Yes. Yep. And then you can just see the responses. A bit of a, it takes a week before Mr. Brayford responds, as well. Uh, and you can just sort of see that they're having a process conversation around organising that meeting. Yes. And then if we just turn backwards to page nineteen, Treasury sends your EA sends to Mr. Brayford and Mr. West basically the identical email that she sends to the Treasurer's office on the same day that she sends it to the Treasurer's office, uh, asking for a meeting with Deputy Premier and closing Mr. Webster's resume uh, as well. You see that? Yes. And she is doing that the same day that she gets a response. She's doing it with the Treasurer's office. But you can see this time the Treasurer's office asks for a short list Mr. Brayford moves to uh, say that he'll get some times with the Deputy Premier to miss, meet with Mr. Webster. You see that? This is at the top of yep. page 19 you're yep. talking about? Yes. Mr. Webster tells us that that meeting with the Deputy Premier never happened. Uh, at all. Right. And this is all happening on Monday the 25th of June, January. Um, did... From Monday the 25th of January onwards, do you recall the Deputy Premier telling you that Mr. Webster was inappropriate for the role? No, I don't. No. Do you recall him expressing any dissatisfaction with the process that you were running? No. So until this point, you had no idea that such a meeting was being scheduled or...? I, I, I didn't know specifically it was being scheduled, but I would have thought it would have been being organised, Mr Mookie, because that was the process required. Um, and Miss Harrison was incredibly efficient. Um, so hence this correspondence. So hence the... <coughs> fair enough. And But... Hence my point, that it looks as though Mr. Barillaro unilaterally decides that there's something wrong with Mr. Webster, never discusses it with you, and then goes and causes Mr. Cartwright to enter the process. That's what it looks like. How, how does it look like that? Order. How? Order. Well, Mr. Let, Fang. I'm sorry, Mr. Fang doesn't understand the sequence here, so let me I just take it through. I think it's best to ignore I'm very happy to take interjections Mr. And, and perhaps best not to make them in the first place. Uh, Mr. Mookie. No, I, I, sorry if my question was ambiguous, but for Mr. Fang's sake, I'll just take you through the narrative of events. Um, from January 12, you, uh, your office is seeking uh, a meeting with the Treasurer's office and the Deputy Premier's office to introduce them to Mr. Webster, for whom you have endorsed as a person who can go forward in the process. Uh, Around the 18th of January, such work to commence those meetings begins. On the 25th of January, your EA sends to the Treasurer's Office and the Deputy Premier's Office a request for a meeting. Uh, the, de the Treasurer responds by asking for a short list. The Deputy Premier's Office notionally starts ask agrees to the meeting with Mr Webster, for which we don't understand. Uh, but then sometime between the 25th of January and either the 2nd of February or the 18th of February, 
Mr. Barilaro has intervened and sought Mr. Cartwright, or at least expressed to Mr. Cartwright the fact that this role is available, and Mr. Cartwright then decides to enter the process. But that's now, not, that's... I'm putting to the witness that that looks as though Mr. Cartwright, Mr. Barilaro got the list, decided something was wrong for it, and then decided to fix the problem himself. Do you have any he didn't get the list. insight? He only got the Mr. CV Fett, from Wes. Excuse me. Yeah, but I'm saying that the premise is wrong. Order, order. The no. premise is wrong. He didn't get order. the list. Order, Wes. This is Mr. Mookie's asking you questions. He he's putting it he to. He got the list. He is putting it, was sent it to, him to him Mr. Pratt. Emails. If you could stop interjecting, please. Continue, Mr. Mookie. At any point, did the deputy premier alert you to the fact that he had a problem with the process that you were leading? and decided that the candidate that you wanted to progress with was inappropriate for the role? Not that I can recall, Mr Bookie. And did he... When he nominated Mr Cartwright, or at least drew Mr Cartwright's potential candidacy to your attention, did he make reference to the fact that he had met with Mr Webster or he had any contact with Mr Webster? Not that I remember, because I, I don't remember any specific feedback on Mr Webster, no. Given Mr Webster has told us that no such meeting ever happened, uh, did he tell you, did Deputy Premier ever tell you that he didn't want to meet with Mr Webster? No, not that I can recall. Okay, thank you. That I mean, clarifies. you'd appreciate these are really questions for the de former Deputy Premier. They are. Uh, mm. no, they I'm are. Just, trying to get uh, I do, uh, Mr Pratt. But, I'm um, just going to raise a point of order. Go ahead. Okay. Again, I'm looking at these emails. Uh, it clearly says that uh, Mr Pratt's EA sent to Mr Brayford Paul Webster's CV. Mr Fang, what exactly is your point of order based not on that? Not the list. Is it so it's not, questioning it's not, the... Well, the, the, the premise of Mr Mookie's question was that... Can I uh, suggest you deal with this by way of questions at the end? That's it's, like... Well, no, 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 I'm... The, question to Mr Mookie. It's a, yeah. You don't get to ask Mr Mookie questions. That's but Mr Mookie's put a wrong premise in the question. Well, that's... It's a fact. It's not a point of order. It's not a point of order. Clearly, order members are... Uh, Thank you, uh, 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 what? ...can it's ask false. questions it's as they see fit. Fit it's to the witnesses, Mr. Fang, just because you disagree with the question, it's a false that's not premise. a point the of order. Order. Point to that. Mr. F uh, Mr. Okay. Mulcahy, you can we continue. Can't, we can't, just can't do that. No. We'll give you 15 minutes at the end and you can go crazy. No, I don't go crazy. Mr. Mulcahy. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Pratt, can I ask you? Did you have any conversations with the Treasurer's Chief of Staff about any, any matter to do with the UK Agent General? Um, the answer would be yes. Um, specifically, they would have been like general updates, I suspect, Mr Mulkey, from time to time, like I've talked about with, with the uh, Treasurer. OK. So what in, was this in the context of your a weekly meeting, emails... Casual catch-ups. Yeah, casual catch-ups sort of thing, yes. Okay. I mean, I, undoubtedly that subject would have come up, yes. And do you recall having any conversations with Mr Black sometime between the 25th of January and or the... We'll go to the 31st of March. Any specific conversations? On this matter, no. I mean, I would have had conversations with him. You know, I spoke to him often. But um, on this specific matter, no recollection, no. Okay. And do you recall around the 25th of March, Mr Black uh, soliciting any further information around the shortlisted candidates for the UK role? No, I don't. Okay. Uh, just before we move off those interactions, do you recall any conversation <coughs> with the Treasurer in which he discussed... Uh, again, I know I asked you this before, but I might ask again. Do you recall any specific conversations with the Treasurer in which he discussed any conversations he was having with Mr Bauraro about Mr Cartwright's potential candidacy and or remuneration? No, I do not. None? No. Okay. Do nor, you mind... with, nor with Mr Black or the Treasurer's no. office. No. Do you, do you mind turning to page 35 and 30 to 37 of uh, the tender bundle? But We'll pick it up from page 35... Down the bottom, you can see that there's a correspondence from Mr Cartwright to Dr Broadbent. You see that? Yes. You've seen this email before, haven't you? Um, possibly, Mr Mookie. I'm just scanning it now to see if I recognise it. It's over page 35 and 36, but if you need to obviously have a look at it. I 
I'm not sure if I've seen it, but I'm reading it. I've scanned it, Mr. Mookie. I'm happy to Yeah, over on page 35 and 36? 36, yeah. Great. And uh, you can see this is an email that... Well, if you go from page 36 to 37, you can see the context by which it happens. But in effect, to cut a long story short, the panel interviews Mr Cartwright on the 30th. Um, it's decided that Mr Cartwright is a candidate. Uh, I think you instruct Dr Broadbent to immediately, or at least the panel does, to let Mr Cartwright know. Uh, and you can see Mr. Broad, Dr Broadbent does that at 9.42pm that day and for which Mr Cartwright replies the next morning at 9.47am setting out this email which says the, the relevant sections, there's a few relevant sections, but when the Deputy Premier first asked me to consider the role back in early Feb, he and I had a very open and frank discussion about my circumstances, i.e. I've been on a package of over 800000 for some years and have made financial commitments accordingly and about his view that the current package on offer was not attracting the right calibre of candidate. Uh, apart from approving the package, he indicated privately, of course, that he and the Treasurer had reached an agreement at the cost of suitable family accommodation and other matters could be taken care of by the New South Wales Government outside of the salary package. Uh, he also goes on to talk about school fees as well as other matters to do with his remuneration uh, as well. So, just again, were you aware that the Deputy Premier and, uh, was having such conversations with Mr Cartwright? No. Did he disclose that to you? No, not that I can recall at all. I would, I would recall that specifically, I think, if he did. And when you saw this email, do you recall thinking, gee, I should maybe talk to the Treasurer about whether he agrees with all this? Well, I'm not sure I've actually seen the email, Mr Mookie, but... I can take you now then to page 34. I'm happy to comment on it. Yeah, I'll take 34. you that. If you yeah. can see, if we go forward in time. Yes. You can see that Dr Broadbent... We'll stay on 35 because let's just work that the, you can see that Dr Broadbent forwards this to Miss West uh, the next day. Actually, the same day. day. 9.47am, yeah. Dr Broadbent gets it. Less than an hour later. And less yeah. than an hour later, she forwards it to Miss West. Right. You see that? Yes. And then just go forward to the page 34. Yes. Miss, Doc, Miss West gets the email at 10.28am and she's forwarded it to you and Mr. Nine Reardon later. nine minutes later at 10.37. You see that? Yes. And then you reply an hour later. You say, thanks, Jenny. Please sit down with Stephen and get clarity on his requirements and draft a package together for us to review. As discussed last night, I do not believe his expectations that I'm aware of are unreasonable in these circumstances, but need to package up and look overall. You see that? Yes. So, Mr. Pratt, I, confirm, I, I infer from that that you had seen the email and that you replied to it. And, and I would have seen it if that's the case. Yes. Yep. And then in addition to that, you would have had a discussion with Miss West the night before about the salary package. Well, I don't know that I would have, but... Well, it says possible. as discussed last night. Yes, that's possible, yep. And then you also had a view that his, his salary package was not unreasonable in these circumstances. Yes. Okay. So... He was, bearing in mind, Mr Moogie, I might just add that we'd, we'd gotten to no detail at that point. Um, you know, the, the comments that I make here in the context of understanding an expatriate package, um, where you can go bottom up, base in country and then load it, or you can go full expat package in, in this case in Stirling. My comments saying it's not unreasonable is I think he was asking for... Um, uh, education support and housing support <coughs> at some point um, that would have been that my comment reflects those well it, it might specific. be that the package itself wasn't unusual but you'd agree that the process is certainly unusual I mean you can see on the email the deputy premier is ne apparently according to Mr Cartwright uh, negotiating directly about what Mr Cartwright should get paid well he shouldn't have been doing that clearly including with the treasurer and then he, make, he makes reference, Mr Cartwright is invoking the fact that, that there's a private agreement, um, that he and the Treasurer had reached an agreement. That's 
that the cost of suitable family accommodation could be taken care of outside of the package. Well, I wasn't a party to that. Yeah, no, there's no suggestion that you were, Mr Pratt. Um, this goes to my earlier point about interference. You know, this would have gone through, I expect, through the normal process. Um, I would have had to have signed off a package offer to Mr Cartwright in due course, which I haven't seen. But, but Mr. you Pratt, can see the concern here that you're in this email chain that details a private agreement between the Deputy Premier and the Treasurer. You're here in this email chain saying the expectations aren't unreasonable. Would it have been reasonable for there to be this private agreement between the Deputy Premier and the Treasurer about this remuneration? In your well, view? I can't comment, obviously, on what occurred between them both, Mr Graham, but I, I think you'd appreciate, as the chair of the panel, I would have expected to be leading that discussion and putting that package together. I take your answer to say it would not be reasonable for senior ministers to Without come to that present. agreement. Now, well, they, if... they may have just been having a discussion about what they thought. I, I don't know how concrete you know that would have been, but at some point it would have had to have come back to me uh, to put together. But, OK, Mr Pratt, it's more than a conversation. I mean, the Deputy Premier, according to Mr Caro at least, says that the Deputy Premier thinks that the current package on offer was not attracting the right calibre of candidate. And apart from improving the base package, he mentioned low fives and he indicated privately, of course, that he and the Treasurer reached an agreement. Now, that's, that, goes a long, that, that goes a lot further. That's actually quite a... Well, stark thing for a person to be saying to a candidate who is not yet even in the race. <coughs> Mr Mookie, this is my point. Um, you know, I've had a huge amount of experience in expatriate management. I've been an expat myself three times. I know how these packages work. And the structure of this, I mean, I think somewhere in papers you will find that we talked about 450 base or thereabouts. Um, my opinion of this package it should have been that you keep a base relative to Australian conditions because at some point Mr Cartwright might come back to a role here. So, for example, you don't pay him 800 in base, you pay him a lower amount Mr. Pratt. and you top up in other benefits. And that, that would have had to have come to me. I mean, it's inappropriate that the Deputy Premier is discussing remuneration because he wouldn't know, frankly. And it is inappropriate, though. It is inappropriate, yes. Yeah. Well, if he's making... well. He can have a discussion, but if he's making commitments to the candidate, that is completely inappropriate. And this email shows a commitment. Uh, Mr Cartwright believes a commitment is made. It shows that the Deputy Premier and the Treasurer had reached an agreement that the cost of suitable family accommodation in an inner suburb of London could be taken care of by the New South Wales Government. And that's, that's my point, Mr it? Graham. It was never raised. I mean, it was never yeah. discussed with me. Looking at it now... That's clearly inappropriate, yes. given the framework you established. Yes. But when you saw this email, you, it clearly perhaps didn't register with you, or did it register with you that that may have been inappropriate? Uh, look, it probably didn't in the terms that we're talking about now, because I, I felt rightly that I was in control of the process, and it would have had to come through me anyway, Mr Mookie, so I don't think I responded to that in that context. Okay, but you lose control of the process on the 1st of April, don't you? Yes, I do. It goes to DPC. And so the day before you lose control of the process, you're saying that it's just, you don't think it's unreasonable. Did you know that you were losing control of the process the next day? Um, yes, I did, because it was the 8th of March when I got the email mm. in, in estimates, as I said earlier, um, and the 1st of April was the effective date. Did you... Did you meet with Miss Brown after that to uh, do a handover or any? Uh, Miss West did. Miss West. Well, Miss West moved. And then she moved. And then she moved. Yeah. But then did you ever tell Miss Brown that you thought that the that this salary, these expectations were not unreasonable? Not that I can recall, no. I left that to Miss West. Because equally at the time that this was happening, are you aware of whether or not the job description uh, – required the Agent General to be reporting to you directly? Yes. And, look, this wasn't absolutely set in concrete, but it was certainly the position that I, I, I wanted. Um, and the reason I wanted that was because these roles were so important, I wanted to give them the status that they deserved, um, and, and particularly these two, because one, because of the UK history, but with Japan, you're probably aware there are many Japanese investors that want to get into New South Wales. 
um, and I wanted to make sure I gave Mr Newman, you know, the best opportunity to deliver that. So um, that was the logic behind it, Mr Mooking. It wouldn't have been forever, but I felt if you bury these roles in the hierarchy, they're not going to get the job done that we needed. Okay. Did you meet with Mr Cartwright on the 19th of February? I don't know. Uh, I said I had a coffee with him. It may have been around that time. Mr Cartwright says, on February 2021, I had previously postponed a coffee catch-up with the Treasurer Secretary, Mr Pratt, to seek his advice on my broader career opportunities. I had served under Mr Pratt on the advisory board of Service New South Wales for four years and I held him in very high regard. So I was seeking his advice uh, on career options that I was considering, which accords with your recollection. So that would be the date then if Mr Cartwright's saying that, yep. yes. And it's referred to in this email as well. Right. Yeah, and yeah. to be fair to you, Mr Pratt, I have actually exerted Mr Cartwright's opening statement um, and various other points in which he makes reference to you, right. which are in the tender bundle from page 49 and 50 to 51. Actually, no, it goes to 52. What just the relevant sections of Mr Cartwright's evidence as it affects you. Um, Mr Cartwright says that uh, during this discussion, he asked you about the UK age and general role and that you gave him some general information about the role. Does that accord with your recollection? Yes, it does, yes. And that you encouraged him to throw his hat in the ring. Do you recall encouraging him to throw his hat in the ring? Well, this, um, it's likely I did, but this would have been in the context of uh, the Deputy Premier suggesting to him that he basically look at the job. So he was probably reaffirming that to me, at which point I would have said, I'd encourage you to go through the headhunter. When you say reaffirming, were you aware of that uh, on the 19th of February when you met with him? You're aware that... Look, I can't recall, Mr Graham, but he, he may well have said that to me because yes. it would have been the prior two days, his, right? His evidence was that yeah. he did, in fact, say right. that. Right, OK. Yeah. yeah. And did you tell him that you thought he would be a great candidate? It's highly likely I did, yes. OK. And was that appropriate? Well, it was a, it was a discussion about his career uh, and his options... Um, I don't think it was inappropriate because I certainly wasn't saying you have a leg up for the job. <laughs> but uh, you've got to, I said to him, you've got to go through the headhunter in the process. Okay. Uh, did you disclose to the other panel members on the 30th of March that you'd had this coffee with Mr Cartwright when she said he would be a great candidate? Um, I'm sure I did because we discussed his entry into the process. And But you don't think that necessarily... Uh, that necessarily constituted a conflict that you had to disclose and pull a formal declaration into? Well, I mean, I would have disclosed that I'd met with him, I'm sure, Mr Mookie, but I don't have that detail. Um, but there's no written record of any such disclosure being made. So you are recalling that you think you did? That's correct. Mr Pratt, the reason I ask you is because one of the key criticisms that was then made of Ms Brown in a later process was that she didn't disclose all contact with candidates in the course of this process with her panel. Right. And that was a point of criticism that the Public Service Commissioner made to us in reflecting on the process as well as, uh, to be fair, um, the head review as well identified this as a well, key <clears throat> concern that had some serious consequences. Uh, but hence I'm asking you as well, it does look as though perhaps you had a meeting with Mr Cartwright. There's no record, and so I accept that you may recall that it did, but there's no record of any declaration or any disclosure being made. At this meeting you apparently did say that this person would be a great candidate. Do you think that there was a need for a formal disclosure and a formal declaration? Um, look, because it's not in the minutes doesn't mean it didn't happen, of course. Um, and Mr Cartwright was known to all three panel members quite well, as you'd appreciate. But I don't believe Mr Reardon had any coffees with Mr uh, with Mr well, Cartwright. And to be fair to Mr Smith, he says to us that the only contact he had with Mr Cartwright was, a, it was in 2019, which was well before. It seems like you were the only panel member who had this happen. And... Uh, you, I appreciate that you may recall, 
but you would also be aware that under the various conflict of interest policies and declarations, there's a difference, but there is a requirement every now and then for these formal disclosures. Oh, not... yes, absolutely, and I'm strong on that, Mr Mookie. I, I mean, but do you I... think in retrospect maybe you should have formally declared it? Well, it's highly likely I did, but it's not recorded um, because, I, I mean, if I go back to on what basis do I introduce Mr Cartwright to the panel, then one would be the Barilaro referral... But secondly, it's highly likely I would have said I've just had a coffee with uh, with him. Do, so you, do you recall telling the panel that Mr Barilaro was a person who caused Mr Cartwright to enter the process? Yes. And again, do you not... Um, did that create any concern amongst panel members? None that I can recall, no. OK. Uh, did Mr Cartwright disclose to you that he had met with Mr Barilaro the day prior to your coffee and the day prior to that? I can't recall, um, but it's likely he did, you know, because he was asking me about the role. Um, so it's likely he did mention that. So Mr Cartwright has two meetings over two consecutive days and then meets with you the next day over the course of the three days. I can only presume that no other candidate that you were aware of was meeting with Mr Barilaro? Not that I'm aware of, no. And no other candidate or potential candidate at this point in time was meeting with you? No. Uh, do, you, do you see how perhaps that does look like there's a special process in place for Mr Cartwright, which is outside the standard process? I can see how you might read it that way, Mr Mookie, but... Why shouldn't uh, we conclude that there was a special process for Mr Cartwright? Well, well, he was trying to answer that before you cut him off. Sorry, Mr Pratt, I didn't mean to cut you off. That's all right. No, that's yeah. OK. Um, well, as I've indicated earlier, I mean, he was referred into the process and it was made clear to the DP that he was to have no engagement in the assessment process. And to my knowledge, he absolutely honoured that. Um, I, I don't... Certainly not with me. You'd have to ask Mr Reardon and Mr Smith, but I, knowing the character of those gentlemen, I suspect that was the same answer. Who made it clear to the Deputy Premier that he was to have no... Um, that would have been Miss West. In her role. And when did that occur? That would have been at the point of referral, um, whatever date that would have been. And was that statement made in part because of the fear that the Deputy Premier may become involved? Well, I guess, um, yeah, the answer is yes, Mr Graham, but it goes oh. to Mr Mookie's earlier comment that, you know, I was determined for these appointments not to be political and that we get the right person for the job. So... I guess, uh, Mr Pratt, I guess, um, is, there any, is there any other point you'd like to make around whether or not we should conclude that there was a special process in place for Mr Cartwright that was caused by the Deputy Premier? Well, I can say, Mr Mookie, from my perspective, there was no special process. I mean, once he was in the panel assessment, it, he was treated like anyone else. Whether there was something occurring on the political side... As you'd appreciate, I really don't know. I can't comment on that. The, 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 the evidence is, is that the process was pretty advanced with Mr Webster, almost concluded. That's fair? No. Um, it, it was certainly down the, the chain of approvals, but um, we hadn't satisfied ourselves as a panel on the gaps in Mr Webster for the job, which was at that strategic level which Mr Cartwright clearly had. Yeah. Can I just... Uh, the discussions that you're having with the panel, I mean, the panel isn't meeting a lot and we don't have any documentation, so I accept that there are discussions within the panel. There's no problem there. But I'm just trying to understand, given the documentation shows that really, you know, meetings were being held, discussions were about remuneration and the... And the um, the role with Mr Webster is there. Um, there's documentation that suggests that you'd had a conversation with him at one point that, that had indicated that he was the preferred candidate at that time. What was the committee doing? Were you just waiting for another com another person to appear? Given you had concerns, and you're saying that Mr Cartwright only got in here because of Mr Barilaro. Like, it, there's sort of a disconnect here about how far that was progressing but then what was the active steps being taken by the panel or the recruiter to fill that gap that had that you say sort of was in the in the minds of the panel? Can you take us through that? Um, look, at the time, uh, it was... We'd put in process, and I think the Jenny West uh, documentation shows that, setting up interviews with Premier, Deputy Premier and Treasurer. 
um, and the emails we referred to with Ms Harrison. We were waiting for those to take place and then for that discussion. And what would have then happened is we would have gathered that feedback back from those three interviews back to the panel and had that discussion around whether, in fact, Mr Webster could deal at that stakeholder level, at the, sh at the, at the strategic level, based on the feedback. But that, we, never that... got, we never got that feedback. But then rather than pushing for why such feedback wasn't provided, uh, he, after Mr Barilaro then nominates Mr Cartwright to go forward in the pro or to enter the process, the whole process is then diverted towards assessing Mr Cartwright's candidacy as opposed to completing the assessment of Mr Webster according to your version of events. Well, we still had two candidates in play. But it looks like Mr Webster was taken out without even having a chance to demonstrate his gravitas with the Treasurer, the Deputy Premier or the Premier. And it looks as though you took no steps to make sure that Mr. Tre the, that Mr Webster was given that opportunity. Well, as I said earlier, the panel had concerns around his absolute fit for the role um, and we found a candidate that fitted that criteria very well. Uh, that was our primary responsibility, Mr Mookie. It was not the politics involved. It was rather we now have a candidate who, in our opinion as a panel, is more than capable of doing this job. But you authorised Ms West to go forward with Mr. Pa with, with Mr Webster. You met with Mr Webster. You also authorised Ms Pratt to commence salary negotiations or start looking at remuneration packages, etc. with Mr Webster, didn't you? I did because at that point in time he was our lead candidate. So um, let's just so as you'd out. expect, I, I was not wanting to kill that application at that point because we didn't have anyone else in the in the chain. Okay, let's just do this relatively quickly. But you can see on page six of the tender bundle, got a second December twenty twenty. You can see this is correspondence from Dr Broadbent to Miss West in which Miss Dr Broadbent says, the key recommendation is that Paul Webster is the strongest candidate. He has a very relevant background for the role, the right level of experience, a very good mix of commercial and government experience and strong networks in the UK and Europe. Uh, you see that? I do. Yeah. And then if we go forward to page five, you can see Miss West... forwards it to you and says, as discussed, please finally attach the final recommendations. You see the word final recommendation? Yes. I have interviewed Paul Webster, who's very strong. You see that? Yes. Go up a page, go up the email. You can see Miss West emails you four days later. Again, saying, Mike, further to these emails, Paul Webster is now the final preferred candidate. Yes. Yeah. And then you can see that they start to organise a meeting on 7.45am for 15 minutes on Tuesday, December 22nd. Yes. And then if we were to go to page 16 and page 17, start on page 17. Paul, you can see that Ms. Dr. Broadband is forming Ms. West of conversations and she says that Paul was very pleased with the session with Mike P, which I think is you, and Paul understands the time frame. And then Paul says, I think hearing from Mike that he was the preferred candidate was great. So you did tell Mr Webster that he was the preferred candidate, didn't you? Well, I'd question that, as I've indicated earlier. I would have said lead candidate. Um, I would question that terminology. Okay. Well, you said to him he was the lead candidate. At the time, yes, he was. But you agree that the meeting went well? He was the lead candidate at that point in time. Yeah. Well, you dispute whether or not you said lead or preferred. But Miss Dr Broadbent, at least her email's unambiguous, she says preferred. Well, she wasn't a party to that conversation, I assume. So... Well, to be fair... If that call took place, and I don't know that... I can't verify that it did, but if it did, she wasn't on the line, Mr Mookie, so... Well, she tells us on page 56 in the transcript of your tender bundle, which is the transcript, that I ask her, at this point in time, Mr Pratt, Mr Ridden, Mr Press had already agreed that Paul Webster was the preferred candidate. And she goes, there was a draft panel report to that effect. It's more than just her saying it. She says she drafted a panel report, which, to be frank, 
we're still trying to get our hands on um, as well. So it's more than just lead candidate. There was a draft panel report that had decided that Mr Webster was the preferred candidate, wasn't there? Draft. Yeah, fine, draft. Well, I don't, I don't know, um, but as I've indicated... At that point, he was the lead candidate for this role and naturally I was progressing it because um, other than the concerns I had about him, we had to get that verified. Well, then if we turn to page 12, <coughs> you may have had concerns, but on the 22nd, which to be fair is the day before Dr Broadband is reporting on the fact that Mike is the preferred candidate... Sorry, that, that you've told Mr Webster that he's the preferred candidate. The day before, you've authorised Miss West to process, proceed with Paul. You see that on page 12? Yes. And you say that after Christmas, first interview with the Treasurer, then Premier and Deputy Premier, separately in whatever order you can arrange. This may take two months. So when you authorise Miss West to proceed with Paul, did you tell her that, oh, but by the way, there's this chance we might still be looking for someone else? Um, she would have been, uh, highly likely she would have been in the panel because she was the secretariat and so she would have been a party to those discussions. But um, do you, so what, do you disclose to her that, but then what did you expect her to do given you're telling her to move ahead with Paul, schedule the first interview with Treasurer, the Premier and Deputy Premier, but on the side, in the event that out of nowhere someone else comes back, the entire process would be upended. How well, is that, she meant to action that? Well, at that point, she was writing to me saying, can we go ahead in the process? Um, I've given her approval to do that. And that was the interviews that we've already talked about at length with Premier, Deputy Premier and Treasurer. Um, well, then... The lead candidate. So this is absolutely the right thing to do. So then if we turn to page 13... You can see that there's another email that you send to Miss West and to your PA, CC your PA, in which you say, thanks, Jenny, next step to brief Treasurer and set up interview towards the end of January on his return. You see that? Yes. So I presume, were you having conversations with the Treasurer at the time, the, Mr Webster, or did you disclose to the Treasurer at any point sometime between December and February that, hey, a request is going to come to you to meet with a guy called Paul Webster for the Agent General role? Look, I can't recall, but it's likely I did. Um, and then I'm asking Miss West here to progress that. But you can see uh, Dr Broadband goes on to tell us in her evidence that she actually does commence quite advanced salary negotiations with Mr Pratt, with uh, Mr Webster, and that Mr Webster's expectations are far more in line with the standard package rather than the package that was eventually agreed to with Mr Cartwright. Um, at any point... Uh, I presume you never told, and given that you have authorised Miss West to start looking at remunerations package, it's it's clear that it's not the case that Mr. Preferred Car Webster was just the lead candidate. You had authorised your officials to take some very serious steps to make sure he becomes the agent general, correct? Well, these were the steps that you know when we were ready to make an appointment. I wanted to make sure that we had all these basic steps in place. So um, that it that comment around remuneration indicates more about remuneration structure than a specific offer. I don't... That, that was not about, you know, let's put together base and benefits and whatever. It's a structure of the package, Mr Mookie, that I was wanting to get underway. I, to the best of my knowledge, and I, you'd have to ask Miss West this, but certainly did not authorise Miss Broadbent to start discussing remuneration detail with Mr Webster. Well, I'll close with this, Mr Pratt. Isn't the better interpretation of events was that as secretary, you caused your department to run a fair and independent process. That led to the selection of Mr <coughs> Webster as a preferred candidate. Mr Webster's candidacy was killed after Mr Barilaro got himself involved and then Mr Cartwright walked away with the job. Well, that's you joining the dots, you know, in terms of how you see it, Mr Mookie. Uh, from my perspective, I would say we had a thorough process... Um, we looked at Mr Webster's strength and, and where the gaps were. We then found a candidate uh, that met those gaps and was a very good appointment. And, you know, what's interesting now, and you, I'm sure you get the feedback, but what I'm hearing in the UK is that Mr Cartwright is doing exceptionally well. 
and Mr. Webster, in fact, has joined his, as his number two. Mm. So yeah, I, I'd have getting, to say to you, Mr. I'm Morgan, not getting the first feedback. I am getting good feedback about Mr. Webster. Yeah, I mean, I, I just make a, an aside comment, there. but this actually fits the panel's view of both gentlemen. You know, Mr. Cartwright is much more strategic operating at that stakeholder level. Mr. Webster is excellent operationally with his trade administration. Mr. Craig, can I just put one final question to you about that 19 February Stephen Cartwright meeting? I just want to put to you again, just because it wasn't quite clear as we were talking before, was that the first you had heard of Mr Cartwright's interest in the role on the 19th of February? As far as I can recall, yes, Mr Gray, yes. Thank you. Okay, that is the uh, end of questions from the opposition. Are there questions from government members? Uh, yes. Uh, I'm okay. Follow. Mr Pratt, nice to see you. Thank you. Um, and thank you for being here today. Um, just with respect, you, um, you outlined both that um, the panel had, and I quote, concerns around the absolute fit for the role of Mr Webster and also that um, Mr Webster hadn't satisfied uh, or the, the panel weren't satisfied on the gaps that Mr Webster had, um, especially at a strategic level, um, and those that Mr Cartwright had indeed. Um, was that something you ever expressed to either the Treasurer or the Deputy Premier or any other member of elected government? Not that I can recall, no. Um, it was really an internal panel discussion at that level. OK, thank you. Um, and did the panel ever make a final determination on uh, to recommend to Cabinet the appointment of Mr Paul Webster? Uh, not that I'm aware of, no. OK, thank you. Um, and when it comes to the consideration of Mr Cartwright and when Mr Barillaro raised that with you, at that point did he insist that Mr Cartwright be considered or was it just offered to you as an option for the panel potentially? Look, I'm sorry, uh, Mr Fellow, I can't remember exactly how that was positioned, but it was certainly the DP that referred him into the process. Thank you. Um, I think that's all from me, <coughs> Mr Fang. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mr. Pratt, for um, providing. Oh, sorry, me. just one more I might sure. actually ask. Yeah. And also, um, with respect <coughs> to the paying conditions of Mr. Cartwright, were you ever instructed by the then Treasurer at the time, now Premier, um, to alter the package that was on offer when it came to remuneration? Uh, no, I wasn't. In fact, I, I had no involvement in Mr. Cartwright's package. The panel role ended when we recommended him and the um, Mike Newman for Japan. Um, that was passed to DPC Investment New South Wales to then negotiate those details. Thank you, Mr. I think the only interaction I had, Mr. Fellow, at one point I might have asked, how's it going? Because I was interested in the overall strategy being delivered, but I didn't play any role in the remuneration discussions. No. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Payne. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Pratt, thank you for um, making yourself available today. Um, I know Mr. Mookie took you through uh, the, the tender bundle and uh, took you to um, parts of the evidence around, uh, I think it was around February, when uh, there was an expectation that the Treasurer and the Deputy Premier would meet with the lead candidate, uh, being Mr Webster. Uh, Mr Mookie put to you that um, uh, Mr Barillaro had received uh, the list, which I will note um, was only Mr Webster's CV and the, the, the panel notes, not the actual um, uh, preferred candidate CVs as um, the Treasurer had received. That was a different email. And that um, there was a question uh, around uh, the way with which the Deputy Premier had engaged with you after that. In relation to Mr Webster, uh, Mr Mookie put it to you that um, Mr Barillaro had determined that he wasn't the, can the right candidate for the job. I think that was the way that he phrased one of the questions. But he didn't actually meet with Mr Webster. We established that. Is that your understanding as well? Um, as far as I know, because I didn't receive any feedback. So is it reasonable that um, Mr Mookie's <coughs> assumption that uh, Mr Barillaro had determined that Mr Webster was not the right candidate um, is perhaps a, a um, determination a bit too far to be made uh, using the evidence because at no time did Mr Barillaro meet with Mr Webster in the cap capacity where he was the lead candidate. 
Well, if Mr Barilaro made that determination, uh, obviously it would have need to be a desktop analysis, not not by interview. If he, did, I mean, I, I don't know, as I said, whether he actually interviewed him or not. Yep. Um, but it would have been on the paperwork that we would have sent through. Right. Um, well, I'll put it to you then that um, Mr Barilaro didn't meet with Mr Webster. Mr Barilaro didn't determine that Mr Webster was uh, an unsuitable candidate. Uh, I'll put it Just to you that... another one. Chair, I'll note that uh, there was much uh, mirth uh, when perhaps I might have made some in, uh, interjections. However, the Leader of the Opposition seems to do so. Yeah. Keep going, Mr Fang. It, Thank it, you. Was, it was one interjection. I was waiting to see what, what happened and uh, it, it stopped and so did you. But if you could just continue your line of questioning, we'll be, Thank you. We'll be fine. Um, so, Mr Pratt, I put it to you that um, Mr Barilaro didn't do any of those things, that... Um, is perhaps uh, that Mr Barilaro found a candidate that um, was um, perhaps very um, – would, would meet a lot of the requirements um, and knowing that the process hadn't finished <coughs> had suggested that he undergo the process as well and that was in order to provide New South Wales with the best strategic person uh, in that role. Would that be a, a, another assumption that could be made out of the evidence? Well, it's related to Mr Mookie's earlier question to me where we, we choose to both disagree on this point, but the panel's role was to get the best candidate. I had no issue with Mr Barilaro recommending him into the process, providing he had no role in that process. Yep. And to the best of my knowledge, he did not. And so the same panel that interviewed the initial um, shortlisted uh, candidates for the role is the same panel that interviewed Mr Cartwright for the role. That's correct. And in that circumstance, those uh, can, those uh, panel members determined that Mr Cartwright was a more suitable candidate than Mr Webster, uh, given the same process of selection. That's correct. And in that circumstance, the has anybody uh, that you're aware of questioned the uh, selection panel, questioned the the makeup uh, questioned the integrity of the process of the, that interview um, and uh, screening uh, that occurred to provide uh, a short list or uh, sorry preferred candidate mm -hmm. being Mr Cartwright. No, mm -hmm. not that I'm aware of. No. Right. So, in much the same way that Mr Barilaro underwent a uh, independent um, uh, uh, selection process in order to be provided the Sticks America role, um, the Mr Cartwright, um, while may have been, I guess, put forward by the, the minister at the time, um, was still required to undergo that same independent selection process and came out as the, the, the preferred candidate. That's correct. There was no change in the process, no. There was no political interference? Absolutely none. No. Well... In respect of me, I, I mean, you'd have to ask Mr Reardon and Mr Smith that, but as I indicated earlier, um, knowing those gentlemen well, I suspect no. And, and nobody has, has uh, that you're aware of has put that proposition that, that uh, there's been any political inf interference with those gentlemen? No. No. Um, in relation to Mr Webster, was he – did he sign a contract? No, I don't think any offer was ever made to Mr. No, Webster. No, that was my next question. An offer, a final offer, was never made, and no, no contract. In fact, was I don't signed. think there was any draft offer at all either. So, so there was um, there was no. Uh, while, while the process um, was continuing, that he was initially the lead candidate, and there were uh, mechanisms being um, actioned to continue that selection process, the process was still open. Uh, there was a candidate with um, uh, that was put forward that had um, excellent uh, experience within New South Wales and also the wider um, geo um, political, I guess, uh, business um, uh, dealings. And so the process being open, that, that person was allowed to um, undertake the same process. That's correct. So no no, pref no preferential um, treatment was given to that candidate? No. If a similar candidate, uh, and going to the point that Mr Mookie made, 
if a similar candidate of a similar calibre um, had approached you directly as opposed to having that conversation with the trade minister, which, you know, being the trade minister, you can understand that there is that, that stakeholder engagement at that level. Would you have um, provided them the opportunity as well to, um, to have undergone the whole process as Mr Cartwright did? I would have taken it to the panel as I did with Mr Cartwright and discussed it at the panel and then made a decision together on that basis, which is what we did with Mr Cartwright. Right. So um, the, the pro um, premise that's been put forward by the opposition that this was uh, the direction of the Deputy Premier um, and, and that, you know, he was given preferential treatment um, is perhaps not supported by... Uh, the evidence and also fails to acknowledge that um, there would have been a similar um, uh, process for a similarly um, suitable candidate. I can only talk about the process we adopted and as I've said a number of times, uh, it was not a political involvement at that level. So no other, um, no other senior um, suitable candidate actually Inquired. That's the only reason why uh, Mr. Carroll was the only get a person. Coffee with Mr. Pratt. I order, order. Sorry, don't, don't I apologise. If Mr. Fang could not respond to the interjection, we've got uh, another five minutes. Uh, please continue. Please. Um, so it's it's purely just the case, isn't it, uh, Mr. Pratt, that nobody else had sought to um, uh, the opportunity to actually. Um, Go undergo the whole process as Mr Cartwright did? No, but as I indicated earlier, uh, at an earlier stage of the process, um, there were others that inquired about the role, um, as would be expected, uh, but didn't progress. And um, just finally, I know that the opposition, um, I guess, was in, in a uh, roundabout way being critical of you um, and perhaps suggested that it was inappropriate for you to... Uh, meet with um, oh, stakeholders. None of, us are, none of us are saying that. Yeah, no, Mr. Mr. Mookie actually did use the word inappropriate about... Asked him. So... I'm just complaining about him having coffee. Yeah. So, um, Mr. Pratt, could you perhaps just um, provide a little bit more context about this? Because um, certainly uh, I would consider that it's actually part of um, the role to have that stakeholder engagement, particularly with senior um, business leaders in, you know, around the state and, and indeed across, you know, the country. Um, was it unusual for you to do this? Like, was, it, was it outside the norm? Um, would you consider it inappropriate? No, in fact, uh, I would argue strongly that the reason, one of the reasons we got through COVID uh, with the economy intact was the business relationships that I and Treasury had developed with the business sector. Uh, Mr Farlow was a part of that at the time in, on a lot of the calls that sure, we did. Sure, he was did. a very strong part of it. He's a very um, good operator. I mean, it, I don't see to your question how you can become the Secretary of Treasury without having those relationships. Mm. Uh, it is fundamental to, to market understanding and government borrowings and a whole range of things. So mm. it was not unusual for me to meet any number of these people every week. So in circumstances where the opposition would perhaps suggest that it's inappropriate um, that you have these stakeholder engagements, to, would that perhaps um, draw into question their ability to govern, given that <laughs> they... <laughs> given that they seem... Tell us that, what you really that, think, that, <laughs> That these are that these. Oh no, he's a private citizen now. He can provide commentary. Oh, God, now, commentary now, you know, is it is it perhaps a sign? Is it perhaps a sign that they are feedback. just not willing? We they're not not uh, not suitable to govern, given that they have uh, clearly uh, devalued the uh, government stakeholder relationship to the point where <laughs> the secretary can't have a coffee with you know uh, the the leader of the business New South Wales. Well, look, I'm clearly not going to comment on that. Oh, um, go on. Go on. All, all I would say is I've had many interchanges with Mr Mookie over the years and I respect him highly. Uh, he's very diligent in what he does, um, as are members of parliament that I have worked with, not on both sides of the House. If I see you, if I, if I see you in a diplomatic role, Mr. Pratt, at some point in the future, <laughs> I won't be surprised. I'm you, under Chair. oath and I'm telling you how I see it. So. Understood. 
Okay, with that uh, last uh, uh, question, uh, we have come to the end of uh, this uh, session and today's hearing. Thank you again, Mr Pratt, for agreeing to uh, to appear today. No questions were taken on notice and uh, that's the end of today's hearing. I believe we have another hearing next week. Thank, Thank you. you.